Giancarlo Stanton and the Miami Marlins travel to New York to face the Mets. Rip right field towards the corner. Gone! The three games at 3.30 Eastern, followed by first pitch at 4.30. Saturday on ESPN Radio. Get ready to embrace debate. First Take starts now. Coming up on the First Take podcast, did the Rockets cost themselves game two against the Warriors? And one of Tom Brady's closest friends comes to his defense. And we preview game two of the Eastern Conference Finals. All that and more coming up on the First Take Podcast, which starts right now. Good morning, everyone. It is Friday. It's First Take. It's First Take Friday. I'm Carrie Champion, Skip Bayless in Bristol, Connecticut, Stephen A. Smith in Atlanta. How are you, Mr. Smith? What's going on, y'all? How y'all doing? Good morning. Oh, good. He's still in Atlanta? He's still there. Oh, he has work to do. I can't keep I can't keep up with him during debates uh, or where he is from day to day. His location, yeah. yeah. Well, he's, um, he's there's covering. a game. There's yeah. a game taking place in Atlanta tonight. I'm sure you'll be watching it. What's your problem? <laughs> oh, you mean uh -huh. you'll be at this game? It's official. Uh oh. I'm at every game. Oh, well, then that, this series I'm is covering about this to be tied. Series. Then. That's it, what's going to happen. It, you think so? Yeah. Okay. Well, get to that. Not if Carol does. Not if Carol's not playing tonight. Well, we'll, we'll is, see about that. Yeah, that is the big question coming up on the show today. Cavs, Hawks, who wins? Will Damari Carroll play? So that's what we're talking about. Plus, more on the gate. Uh, someone says, and he's a friend of the show. Uh, Tom Brady is in this for the long haul. He's ready to fight. We will discuss that as well. But first, Golden State walks away with the win. It wasn't easy. The Rockets fought their way back uh, into the game from a 17-point deficit in the second quarter and had a chance to win in the final seconds of the game. But James Harden lost the ball while being double-teamed by Steph Curry and Clay Thompson as time expired. Our own Mark Jackson, who was calling the game, questioned if uh, Kevin McHale should have called a timeout to set up that final play. Harden scored 38 points on 13 of 21 shooting, grabbed 10 rebounds and 9 assists. Uh, quite possibly, he could have won the game for the Rockets. So here's the question, and Stephen, I'll tee it up to you, because that's what everyone was saying last night. Do you believe uh, that there was a missed opportunity by not calling a timeout? I respectfully disagree with, the, with Mark Jackson, my man, along with Jeff Van Gunny and anybody else who's of the mindset that, the, that Kevin McHale should have called a timeout. I can certainly understand their point, and I think you can make arguments in both directions, Skip. It's just that I, I personally didn't have a problem with what Kevin McHale elected to do. When Harrison Barnes missed that layup, he ultimately was out of the play. Uh, Iguodala, if I remember correctly, he was out of the play as well. So essentially you had a four-on-three scenario. When James Harden was driving down the court, he basically had Klay Thompson to his right and Steph Curry right in front of him. Uh, they impeded his ability to drive to the basket. He stepped back like he always does with a step back move between his legs. At that particular juncture, he could have launched a jump shot, which we all know James Harden is capable of making. Instead, what he elected to do was give the ball to Dwight Howard, who's no three-point shooter near the top of the key. Dwight Howard wisely, predictably gave the ball right back to James Harden, and then James Harden obviously was in a tough spot because at that particular juncture, both Clay and Steph had an opportunity to suffocate him in a way that they didn't when he had the ball in his hands and he was driving to the basket. So if I'm Kevin McHale, I want James Harden in that initial scenario because James Harden could have pulled up for a J and won the game on a jump shot as opposed to electing to give it to Dwight Howard. Calling a timeout would have given Golden State, who had no timeouts left, an opportunity to really set their defense. And you've raved all year long, Skip, about their defense and how lethal it has been. They're long, they're athletic, particularly when they're small, they're very, very fast. And as a result, I think that would have been a mistake to give them an opportunity to set their defense for a final play. I thought that Kevin McHale made the right call. I just don't think that James Harden made the right play mm. by giving up the ball to Dwight Howard. Wow. He should have never given up that basketball. He should have stepped back and shot the Jay. Or drove to the basket and try to get the foul because he does get the foul, even though I don't believe he would have gotten it in that situation. But I would not have given the ball to Dwight Howard at the top of the key because that serves no purpose. Okay, so bottom line, I hate to use this word because it's a little harsh, but you are blaming James Harden for failing to seize the moment and shoot the jumper and give it up to Dwight. James Harden played a terrific game, 38-10-9. Terrific, doesn't even begin to But tell. the last play, 
That's yeah. right. He was sensational. Whew. But the last play, I think you saw him on the ground, you know, exasperated you and are. frustrated because he knows in his heart of hearts he should have never given up the ball to Dwight Howard. He should have just taken that last shot. That's what he should have done. He knows that's where he just made a mistake. That's all. Okay. I, I'm going to go a little different direction. I don't vehemently disagree with the point you're making, but I do disagree with it. Number one, I have zero problem with the way James Harden handled the whole final sequence, or for that matter, the way Kevin McHale handled it by not calling timeout. But instead of blaming McHale or James Harden, I'm going to credit Steph Curry, the MVP, for making the decision, having the guts to make the decision to leave his man be. I think he had Trevor Ariza on the play, and Ariza was breaking down the left side, waving for the basketball. Steph knew that one man and only one man was going to take that shot. So he made the choice to me that saved the game and, and I think completely changed this series. Because one-to-one -one going back to Houston would have been a whole different story than 2-0 going back to Houston. But my point is, number one, I have no problem with Kevin McHale not calling timeout because Ball comes off the board, six seconds left on the Harrison Barnes miss on the reverse layup. James Harden gets the rebound. Who better to have the basketball in his hands going full tilt against a helter-skelter defense than James Harden? Is there anybody better in the NBA? Because that's, that's what Kevin McHale said. I don't know anybody better. Nobody can split double teams better, can, can get the ball to the basket and shoot free throws better than James Harden. So I loved it that Kevin McHale said, just go. And if Clay Thompson had been the sole defender on James Harden, which I thought was about to happen, and obviously I'm rooting for Golden State because I picked Golden State to sweep. Stephen A., I fully expected as he passed half court that James Harden was going to make two free throws to win that basketball game. And to my shock and my surprise and my glee, Steph Curry left his guy and cut off James Harden's left-handed path to the basket. It was a gutsy, beautiful defensive play by the man who led the league in overall steals, Steph Curry. And again, he stopped him so cold because they haven't been doubling James Harden the whole day. They just, they just play him straight up with Klay Thompson. And Klay Thompson has just been worn out on offense like he just has no legs to even shoot the basketball. But the point is, James Harden got shocked into having to give the ball up to Dwight, who then hot potatoed it right back to James so he could reestablish. And then guess what happened? Steph Curry stole the basketball. Right. He flicked his hand in, got his hand on the ball, dislodged it. It goes between James Harden's legs, and the clock ran out. So to me, the play of the series so far, but you know, both Splash Brothers obviously made the defensive stop, but Steph was right there in his path to stop him first, make him give the ball up, and then steal the ball from him. Those are two. He, he's not getting enough credit well, for that. I'm going to credit him more than I'm going to blame James for that one. I disagree with you. And the reason I disagree with you is, number one, when James Harden was driving down the court, Trevor Ariza was, Trevor Ariza was trailing him. So when Steph Curry tried to impede James Harden's, uh, you know, you know, path to the basket, if you look at the replay here, Skip Bayless, Trevor is trailing. So he's not yet in position to shoot. Now, once he guts it, when James Harden gives up right before he gave up the ball, Trevor Ariza comes into the picture, but Harrison Barnes is right there with him. So I'm not going to give, uh, I'm not taking any credit away. I'm just not willing to give Steph Curry as much credit for that play as you're willing to do. I think in the end, when James Harden stepped back, with the cross, with the dribble between his legs, right before he gave the ball up to Dwight Howard, he had room to shoot the J over Steph Curry. That's when he should have taken the shot, as opposed to giving it to Dwight Howard. Just go back and rewind the play and then see it. Watch it closely. I, I know exactly Trevor Reese is trailing. Trevor Reese is about Trevor to be Reza, wide saying, open for a three-point shot if he had had eyes in the back I, of his head and been able to kick it to his left instead of his right. No, to no, drive. no. I'm not talking about that. No, no, no. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying if you're James Harden and you're yeah. dribbling the ball and you're in front of Trevor Reese, you don't see Trevor Reese. All right? So when Steph Curry recognizes that, when Trevor Ariza finally came into the picture, Harrison Barnes was right there next to him. 
James Harden should have never given up the ball to Dwight Howard. I'm not trying to take anything away from James Harden either. He was sensational. But that particular play, he usually, when he's, he usually always sits there and creates room for himself and then steps back and pulls up for the J. He had room once he dribbled the ball between his legs to shoot over Steph Curry. But he didn't. He gave it to Dwight Howard first. By the time he got it back, not only did the defense collapse on him, but he had no time. He wouldn't have had that problem if he never gave up the ball to Dwight Howard. A matter of fact, I'm not even sure James Harden recognized it was Dwight Howard because the clock was winding down. He's driving up court. He's trying to score. And then he looks out of the corner of his right eye and sees a, a red jersey with him. And he threw the ball. It was Dwight Howard. He possibly thought that was Trevor Ariza because he couldn't see that Trevor Ariza was behind him. You understand? And that's what happened. Okay, but you, the point you're missing is that Steph had not doubled James Harden the whole game, obviously. So Steph made a choice that shocked James and stopped him in his tracks. And I don't think he felt comfortable stepping back and shooting well, a long jump shot because he had it in his head. I'm, I'm taking this ball to the basket because they're going to have to foul me. I'm running downhill full speed, and all of a sudden he got stopped cold in his tracks by Steph but, Curry. But what I'm saying is, is that unlike James Harden, who was driving to the basket, Steph Curry could see more than he could see because Steph Curry is looking at the whole play because he's on the defensive side of the ball. So when James Harden is coming at him, he could see that Trevor Ariza is trailing, that Harrison Barnes is trailing with him, and that the White Howard is coming down the middle of the court at the top of the key. So it's an easy decision for him to elect to double up on the man who is not only the second in league MVP honors and a sharpshooter himself, but somebody who's the star of this franchise who's going to be looking to take that last shot. It was an easy decision to make defensively because you could see what James Harden couldn't see. James Harden couldn't see a reason behind him. And he only could see Dwight Howard out of the corner of his eye. And the clock is ticking down to three, down to two, okay. down to one. So to me, it was an easy decision for Steph Curry to make. Okay, but there was still time, two seconds left, when James got the ball back in his hands, he could have pulled off his step back there. And when he tried to, Steph stole the ball from him. He knocked it loose from him. There was still a couple seconds left. There was time to get a shot off, and he lost the handle on the basketball because Steph dislodged it. You've got to give Steph but more because... credit. Well, listen, I'm not taking any credit away from him. The, the brother played the sensational game. He dropped 33, hit five three-pointers. He was electric all night long, and plus he helped assist in preventing James Harden from getting to the basket. I'm only trying to explain to you that it was an easy call to make for him to help Clay Thompson suffocate on James Harden because James Harden is the man, and you could see that Ariza was trailing, and you could see that Dwight Howard was the one coming up the, mid, up the middle of the court at the top of the key. If I have to defend anybody at that particular moment, of course okay. it's going to be James Harden. And then when James Harden ultimately got the ball, he's a lefty, Skip. So in order for him to get, he's not going to get the ball and shoot it here. He's going to get the ball and come this way. And, and, and who was on, Steph Curry who was was on there his side to go that way? Steph Curry was there. Steph's high IQ oh, that's what prevented I'm that play. So again, remember, this is happening so fast. The, the game ended. It was hard to even figure out as a fan watching it what had just happened. Didn't you have to watch a couple of replays to let it sink in what had just happened? Skip, so, when, you're play, when, you're, when you're playing on the court, the game moves slower for you than it does for the fans. I, I, I disagree in that knows moment. Basketball. I think it's helter-skelter chaos. And to, to, to have okay. the, the, call you you're wrong. the rational mind to say, I need to stop his left-handed dribble was the play of the game to me because what you're risking is who's their best clutch shooter? Who's their best three-point clutch shooter? It's Trevor Ariza. So there's, there's a flicker of a chance that James Harden is going to find him for an open three to win the game. And you're taking that chance because you're saying no. His mentality is he's going to drive the basketball. He's not going to look for anybody. He's going to try to get to the free throw line. Steph wouldn't even let him get to the free throw line because he wouldn't let him split the double team. So again, I, I again, you're you're not blaming or condemning James Harden. I'm just giving all the credit to Steph for a better play than James made. 
I disagree. All right, so the series is heading back to Houston uh, where the Rockets will try to even it up, according to our Basketball Power Index. If they win Game 3, they have about a 14% chance of winning the series. Not looking good for the Rockets, but we shall see. We'll talk about that a little later on in our show. Let's talk about LeBron James and Cleveland. They hope to make it a 2 nothing lead as well in the conference finals when they play Atlanta tonight. LeBron James has been up 2 nothing in the best of seven series 14 times in his career. And he's won all 14 of those series, which means the Hawks must win game two tonight if they want a chance to really be in it. Here's the question, though, and you mentioned this earlier, Stephen A. Uh, will Carroll play? He's listed as questionable. So in your mind at this moment, he's not playing. Who wins tonight? Well, if Carroll doesn't play, the Atlanta Hawks will lose tonight's game as well. I think this is their, I, I think right now, the way it looks, it may be their only chance to win this series. And it's through no fault of their own. As I said walking into this series when I predicted Cleveland would win this series in six, the point that I was trying to make is that at the end of the day, no matter how interesting the Atlanta Hawks can make it, who do you have to give the ball to and say, take me to the promised land when all else fails? You don't have that individual on the Atlanta Hawks. That's why it's phenomenal that they won 60 games and they were the number one overall seed within the Eastern Conference because you look at them and you say the, ro the roster is, is, is talented, but the, it's devoid of a superstar. Whereas Cleveland doesn't have that problem. They have one in LeBron James. And if Kyrie Irving were healthy, I think we'd be hard-pressed to predict that Atlanta would win a game in this series. They'd probably get swept. That's not to, just sit there, to, to discredit them and what they've accomplished or whatever. They've been phenomenal. They play team basketball. They spread the floor. They trust one another. They share the basketball. They defend. They're obviously exceptionally well coached by a man who deserves to be coach of the year, and Mike Budenholzer. But in the end, they don't have LeBron James. It's just that simple. And when you have a guy like Damari Carroll, who was assigned to defend him, to be the Jimmy Butler from Chicago of this series, by the way, uh, Carroll's going to need help, uh, even if he were 100%. And that help was gone in Thabo Cephalosha, who got injured in the incident with the police in New York City just a few months back. So with all of that taken into consideration, you know, without Carroll, I don't know how they can win this game unless Cleveland, uh, you know, just takes them for granted, doesn't come come back with the level of fervor and seriousness it deserves, that LeBron spends another five minutes in the fourth quarter playing around because he's laughing at the thought of Paul Millsap trying to defend him in the open court. Devoid of something like that, I don't see how Atlanta can win this game without Damari Carroll. If Damari Carroll can play and he's relatively healthy, I can see Atlanta possibly pulling out this game. But it comes down to not only his availability, but his health, assuming that he is available. If it's not up to par to stick LeBron James, I don't know how they're going to win this game. Mm. I don't need any qualifiers to make my pick. I say Atlanta wins this game with or without Damari Carroll. I'm, I'm going to guess, just to guess, he will try to go. Now, whether he can be a shell of himself at best, I don't know. But I think it would do this team a lot of good, just its psyche, if he tries to go a little bit, the way Kyrie's been trying to go, the way Dwight did go last night. Dwight played really well last night for having whatever was wrong with his knee. Right. That, was, that was a good job by him. Yep. But, look, I said before the series that Atlanta would win one of these two home games, and I thought it would be game one. But I did not foresee that the J.R. and J.R. Smith would stand for just ridiculous. Because <laughs> sometimes it does stand for just ridiculous in a good way. And on this night, as you well know, Stephen A., 8 out of 12 threes, that's virtually unbeatable. And it did win that game. But if you subtract the 8 that J.R. made, Cleveland shot 2 of 14 from 3. And the 2 made were by Kyrie, who is really a pathetic shell of himself with his knee and his foot injuries right now. I don't foresee him being a huge factor in the game again tonight because he wasn't the other night. Uh, what did he last? Just a few, 27 minutes he played. But, but he just, I, I didn't even know he was out there half the time. So Atlanta was a one-point favorite at home in game one. That's gone up to a point and a half tonight because I think the, the odds makers are saying, this is really a good basketball team. All year long, this has been a mentally tough basketball team. So I say they're going to make a stand with or without Damari tonight. And I say they're going to make some threes. Stephen A., the Atlanta Hawks at home in game one shot four for 23 from three. 
Well, obviously, that's just not good enough for, for one of the two best three-point shooting teams in efficiency in the NBA. So I'm going to say they start making some threes. I'm going to say that Jeff T goes from one for six from three to making at least three or four threes. And Kyle Korver makes three or four. And I just think they'll make a stand, an emotional stand, as you keep telling me. That crowd is now legit in Atlanta. So I'm going to say they'll put up a, a legit stand tonight for their home crowd. And I'll say they'll, they'll win a close, sort of low-scoring game. I'll, I'll say like 99 to 96 Atlanta. Well, that would that would require Kyle Korver finding his shot because uh, he hasn't been able to find his shot throughout these playoffs. Shooting 35 percent, 38 percent from the field, about 35 percent from three-point range. His numbers are down significantly. Uh, he looked incredibly frustrated after the game. Skip almost depressed, mm -hmm. yep. like he just can't get it going. And it doesn't help that Iman Shumpert, one of the uh, somebody who's firmly establishing himself as one of the elite perimeter defenders in this game, was draped all over him. And J.R. Smith hasn't been shabby as well. No. Uh, I mean, when you talk about J.R. shot, we've been talking about J.R.'s prowess as a scorer, Skip, one of the things that need to be noted is that this dude is going out there and LeBron James has held these guys accountable for playing defense, and that's exactly what they're doing, yep. playing defense. I don't know about Kyrie Irving, right foot, left knee, both those things are hurting. He's incredibly frustrated. I spoke to him after the game, and you know his mentality is that he ain't sitting out no matter what. These games are too important. He will play. But he's incredibly frustrated because he knows what he can do, and everybody knows what he can do when healthy. And the fact that he's not healthy really, really is raking his nerves. But he's strong mentally. I, feel, I think he'll figure out a way. In the end, what it comes down to is Atlanta's ability to score. Yeah. I think they can get stops from time to time. But who can deliver the scoring for you? I don't know outside of Jeff Teague, who obviously has some uh, capabilities when Kyrie Irving is out. Outside of him, I don't know who else is going to score for them, and that's where the problem lies. Al Horford is really good. Skip, Moskov is no scrub. He can play. And by the way, he's a big boy. He is. I mean, I mean he's bigger than Horford, than Horford and these oh. guys. He's really, really big, and it causes them problems. Okay. It really does. Last quick point. Speaking of scoring, this is the night that Atlanta has to play the right kind of defense on LeBron James. This is the night that Mike Budenholzer, Budenholzer, I'll say it right, who is a son yep. of Greg Popovich, is going to have to adopt the Popovich method against LeBron James. They're basically, oh, again, yeah, yeah. without DeMar, you're, you're going to have to play like a zone. Just, just pull back, take the lane away right. from LeBron, and dare him to shoot jump shots and three-point shots. That's your only and hope tonight without Damari Carroll as your primary defender on LeBron James. And it's setting the stage, Skip, because the bottom line is this. If we're being totally honest, they have to win the night. They have to. If they don't win the yeah. night. They're gonna, Absolutely. They, if they don't win the night, they're probably going to get swept. Yep. So the best argument to make for Atlanta to win tonight's game is that if you don't win, this will likely be your last game in the yep. playoffs I at agree. your home court. Former NFL kicker Jay Feely and obviously former Michigan roommate of one Tom Brady was on the herd explaining he believes that the NFL has made a mess of Deflategate and how he will defend his friend, Tom Brady. The reality is the NFL for 15 years has told quarterbacks you can do anything you want to the ball, and all of a sudden one day decided to make a big deal out of it. And they're the ones who created this, this fiasco. You know, the NFL sort of called the Patriots after the Colts called and, and made an accusation and said, hey, this was what was alleged. Make sure that those balls are according to the PSI specifics for this game. And it would have ended. It would have never been a story. But that's what the NFL has done repeatedly instead of dealing with something the way in the appropriate way and letting people know they try to lay in the weeds and catch people i think he's going to fight it a long time i have no idea what the end result will be but i know that he believes he's innocent i know that he believes that he didn't do anything wrong all right so Stephen a the nfl um according to jay feely was playing gotcha and he knows that tom brady will defend himself to the very end your reaction to what uh, jay feely had to say well, I understand where he's coming from, and I appreciate Jay Philly's candor. He, he's honest about the fact that he's very, very close with Tom Brady, that they're personal friends, that he's got a lot of love for the brother. And I respect Jay Feely coming to his defense. I have no problem with it. 
My issue is with Tom Brady and his unwillingness to come forward while allowing so many others to speak on his behalf. If Tom Brady wants to be quiet, why does he why doesn't he take the liberty to tell everybody else to be quiet <laughs> since he's so hell bent on defending his innocence? I don't get that. The other part with Jay Feely that I don't get is his problem with the NFL, uh, to quote him, laying in the weeds, you know, trying to catch somebody. Well, what are you supposed to do when you're conducting investigation? Be so transparent to the point where you can't catch folks if indeed they do elect to lie to you to make it easier for them to lie to you? If you suspect foul play has taken place, then sometimes you are going to lay in the weeds in order to catch somebody. That's the way an investigation usually works. And I know that Jay Philly has a connection. Obviously, he's an official with the uh, NFL Players Association. I know that he has history there. I know how they think about the NFL. But it just drives me crazy when they walk around acting so surprised at stuff like that. It's par for the course. If somebody believes that you've cheated, if somebody believes that you have engaged in uh, unethical behavior, then in trying to catch you, they're not going to always be straight up. Up in their methods, you in the methodology that they exercise in order to catch you. That's just common sense, and I just think that that's something that Jay Feely and others should understand. I respect the heck out of Jay Feely and what he has to say in defense of Tom Brady. I hope I have, and I believe I have friends like like Jay Feely who would come to my defense. I've got friends that are similar to Jay Feely. I mean, in terms of their thinking when it comes to uh, coming to the defense of a friend, somebody that he obviously believes in, and. Tom Brady says he's innocent. Jay Feely has no reason to believe otherwise. I get all of that. But everybody ain't Tom Brady's friend. Everybody wasn't at Tom Brady's wedding and vice versa. Everybody doesn't, you know, play golf with him and hang out with him and, and exchange text messages and emails and personal phone calls with them. Most people don't have that relationship with Tom Brady. So as a result, they would be on the outside looking in. And this is the perception that would come along with it. And that's something that Jay Feely has to accept. And I say that respectfully because I do respect Jay Feely. Okay, let me go a cut below the surface here and examine what's happening. Let's look at the friendship sure. between Jay Feely and Tom Brady. Remember, they were okay. friends before Tom Brady was Tom, Tom Brady. Brady. They were friends at the University of Michigan. Jay, obviously, on the football team as a kicker. Tom as a quarterback just trying to make it, trying to win a starting job. Nobody really knew who this kid from San Mateo, California was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And the first summer they knew each other, they worked together at a driving range, a golf driving range, just to earn a few extra bucks. So they got pretty close. And because I know Jay fairly well, I can tell you, Jay has seen Tom Brady go through it all all sorts of you know, different kinds of adversity and he's watched Tom react to different kinds of adversity so Jay if anybody does outside obviously Giselle and, and parents close family Jay knows Tom Brady's heart and, and I guess you could say his heart beat he knows when Tom's telling him the truth or when he might be playing with it a little bit his truth meter is strong and gives him an accurate reading when it comes to Tom Brady. So as I told you from the start, I've talked to several people who know Brady, and everybody expressed the same sentiment. It was always, trust me, when he told me he didn't do this, I believe he did not do this, that he's 100% innocent, is what was Jay's quote to Colin Coward. I didn't tell the guys to do anything illegal. That's been Tom Brady's stance from day one on this. So he feels like, he was very unfairly and wrongly convicted of this quote-unquote NFL crime that we all think has permanently stained his legacy. So the reason Jay, Jay Feely is continuing to stand up for Tom is because there was no conversation of, hey, Jay, I, you know, we, we did fudge it a little bit, mm -hmm. and, and if you would, maybe you could defend me publicly on this because I'm going to try to fight back as best I can because I want to get the games reduced from four to two not happening here Tom Brady doesn't care about the appeal unless Roger Goodell wants to reduce the games to zero he would care about the appeal but we all think that's not going to happen so all he cares about is fighting as Jay Feely indicates to the end to the bitter end and if it requires a court battle so be it 
which is why he hired Jeffrey Kessler to represent him, longtime Thorne in the NFL side. So the point is, Jay is completely believing that Tom Brady completely believes he is 100% innocent. So that's why Jay is standing up for him. And you know and I know, we, we all have friends where, you know, you know them so well and you know, well, maybe, maybe they did do a little something yeah. here. That's not what's happening. But here's where I jump off that wagon that you're on. And I'm going to be delicate with it because I don't mean it towards Jay Feely. I'm not questioning him, his integrity or anything. I think he's going to run for office someday. I think he'll win for crying out loud. I know I'd vote for him, to be quite honest with you. But what I'm saying to you is this, Skip. Jay Feely is not a member of the media. We have an obligation, sure. regardless of our feelings, for one person or another to be as objective as we possibly can be. Unless I'm talking about the Knicks and the draft lottery, of course, that's the exception. But outside of that, we have an obligation to be as objective and as fair-minded as we can possibly be, not just towards individuals, but towards the facts. Jay Feely does not have that obligation. So as a result, I'm forced and compelled to ask myself this question. If Tom Brady were to have a conversation with you and say, Jay Feely, I fudged the rules a little bit. I tried to do X, Y, and Z. Would Jay Feely come on the air and tell us? I don't think he would. Nor do I think he, he should. He might just lay low. So what I'm saying. Yeah. He, he might right, not that's say right, anything. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. No, no. I'm, I'm not. That's fair. That's fair. What I'm saying to you is I have no doubt that he believes him. I have no doubt that he's standing behind Tom Brady because Tom Brady has told him I'm innocent and Jay Feely is buying that hook, line, and sinker. I don't blame him for that one bit, nor am I saying they're wrong. I'm just saying that I'm not going to attach the same level of validity to it as you because of their relationship. Because guess what? If you believed otherwise, would you tell us? See, if Damian Woody, who's a former teammate of Tom Brady, he comes on the air and he says, I think he cheated. Teddy Bruschi, also played with Tom Brady, won Super Bowls with him, says, I absolutely don't believe that. When you are a member of the New England Patriots and you see the juxtapositions that exist with people who have played alongside Tom Brady, that's incredibly compelling. Yeah. But to Jay Feely, this seems to, when it comes to Jay Feely, Skip, it seems to be something extra. And I'm not in any way saying that makes him wrong. I'm simply saying that I can't attach the level of veracity to his statements that you're inclined to, not taking into account his friendship. He loves this brother. He yep. knew Tom Brady before he was Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. You know, he's invested in him in a very, very, I'm telling you right now, if Tom Brady came out and admitted that he was guilty, outside of Tom Brady, I don't know of anybody who would be more devastated than Jay Feely. I agree. Because of how he feels about that it. That is correct. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I, I have to, I have to, you know, pause for a second okay. on the Jay Feely stuff right. because of that. Fair enough. And I'm going to be completely fair here. Is it remotely possible that Tom Brady is so ashamed of what he has done that he's in scramble mode with his family and his close friends trying to convince them almost out of delusional, you know, like self-protection that he didn't do anything? That's possible. But I'm not buying that. Here's what I'm buying. I know Jay Feely fairly well to the point that I can tell you He's a good man. I, I've seen him off I the do field. Believe that. I've watched him operate. He's I a do good believe man. That. Jay Feely constantly tells me the finest man he's ever known in all of his years in football and sports is Tom Brady. So th this is why to call to, to brand Tom Brady a cheater is incomprehensible to Jay Feely. Now you can say he's not objective, that, that he's lost. In, in his adoration, you know, his respect for Tom Brady. But I don't think so, Stephen A. I think he just knows this man's what? heart, and he can't see him as this serial cheater what? that a lot of people have condemned him as being that, over the years. That's fair. That's fair. But, Skip, you also have to listen to the words that Jay Feely used. He said, quote, the NFL has been letting quarterbacks do whatever they want with the football for 15 years. And then all of a sudden, here they come making a big deal out of it. So it's entirely possible that Tom Brady could be guilty of it, but only because 
He didn't think it was a big deal because, as Jay yeah. Feely said, the NFL never thought it was a big deal. And then all of a sudden it became a big deal. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm only going by Jay Feely's words, Skip. Nothing more here. We, 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 we introduced this topic by taking Jay Feely's words. Well, if Tom Brady and all the quarterbacks for the last 15 years thought this was much ado about nothing, then maybe that's what is at the heart of this, and Jay Feely might have revealed that without even knowing it. Tom Brady may feel he's completely innocent because there's much ado about nothing because for the last 15 no. years, quarterbacks have been allowed to do whatever okay. they wanted to with okay. the football. But, but remember, his point is, don't take it out of context, allowed to do it within the regulation range because you get Fine. a range. There's a Fine. range on the football for the kickers and the quarterbacks. There's a range of what you can do. So I've told you repeatedly, from what I've been told, Tom Brady never said anything more than inflate my footballs to the lower end of regulation. And again, there's a range. So you can inflate to the lower end or you could do the Aaron Rodgers inflate to the top Listen. end of regulation, right? It's still Listen, legal. And without, and without, without getting too technical to, to, to buffer your point, Skip, if you talk to the New England Patriots, and I'm getting more and more information as the days go by, eight of the 11 footballs uh, that, that were in question for the New England Patriots were almost identical to what the Colts' four footballs were. And nobody's talking about the Indianapolis Colts. And so when we I take have. it into consideration in terms of PSIs and, 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 and the like, in, in the end, what it comes down to is that there are a whole bunch of holes, there are a whole bunch of questions, mm -hmm. and it looks like Tom Brady can pick the actual report apart. He can. But in the end, when you have, when you have NFL players, NFL players sitting there and saying that Tom Brady answered the question, you say, are you a cheater? Are you a liar? In the press conference, he's like, I don't think so. And then, uh, and then you're not, fully cooperating in the eyes of the NFL, it's going to beg the question, why would you allow those questions to exist if you're 100% innocent? Okay. And that's where I, look, we, I mean, it's just what it is. I, I agree with your premise. I've said it on this show many times. I wish Tom Brady would stand up on his soapbox and say, I want everybody to know I'm 100% innocent. Not built that way. And now that it looks like it could go to court, can't be that way. Right. You don't want to say anything publicly because your lawyers are telling you you keep it in house until it's time to testify in court. That's what Jonathan okay. Velma told him. And, and yet I'm with you, Stephen A. I wish you would have yeah. spoken out from the start. It would make my job a lot easier. I can tell you that it would make your life a little easier. At least you'd have something to go on, and we don't have anything to go on. All right, from so Tom Brady. Tom Brady appealed obviously the four-game suspension on the 14th. He had the NFL has 10 days, 10 exact days to respond. So we should be hearing something uh, next week at the earliest. Geico presents strange saving stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Outside the Lines reports that there is a groundswell of support to deny Isaiah Thomas part ownership of the WNBA's Liberty. Thomas turned in paperwork to be a partial owner of the team last week. He needs <laughs> approval from the league's Board of Governors for his ownership application to go through. The WNBA president told the AP last week that she hopes to have this issue resolved before the season starts, which is June 5th. Thomas was introduced as Liberty president saying he hopes everyone keeps an open mind in regards to his past. If you go back and you look at the way I've lived my life and the people who have, who have dealt with me personally, um, I'm proud of, of the way I lived my life and I'm proud of the man that I stand here today before you. So after being fired as Knicks coach in 2008, he remained with the team in an unspecified role, even after a lawsuit brought by former team employee Anusha Brown. Sanders, she alleges that uh, she was sexually harassed in a civil suit. The jury awarded Brown about $11.6 million in damages for being improperly fired. But Thomas himself was not found personally liable financially. Uh, Stephen A., uh, your reaction to everything that's happening? 
Well, my reaction is I'm pretty disgusted with Mr. James Dolan because I think it puts uh, Isaiah Thomas in a precarious position of having to defend himself against charges and allegations that ultimately uh, ended up in MSG uh, doling out $11.6 million in punitive damages when Mr. Dolan himself says uh, that Isaiah Thomas had little to nothing to do with this. If that's the case, then why bring him back with the Liberty, which is obviously a women's basketball league when this national champion, two-time NBA champion, uh, Hall of Famer, one of the 50 greatest players in NBA history, uh, clearly would prefer to be with the New York Knicks, regardless of what anybody thinks or what he himself says. It doesn't seem to make much sense. It seems to set the stage for the kind of questions uh, that are being put before us. Now, the bottom line is this. Anuka Brown Sanders uh, and, 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 you know, and her lawyers went after Isaiah Thomas and MSG uh, for sexual harassment. Ultimately, MSG was found liable. Uh, they had to pay $11.6 million. Talking to Isaiah Thomas, having his name attached to this obviously does not look good. Mm. I have said that to him. Other do, of those uh, other folks in the NBA who are close to him have said have said that to him. And Kerry, Skip, you all know that I've known Isaiah Thomas for about 20 years. I can't talk to him about this. This is as volatile as he gets. I have never seen mm. him more volatile, more angry, more furious than when the word sexual harassment and his name mm. gets associated in the same sentence. He has been adamant and defiant that he has never been he has never been guilty of sexual harassment. He is quick to point to the lawsuit and he gets into the particulars. This is years ago, Skip. I haven't spoken to him about this in more than two years. This guy gets into it where he's talking about how Look at the, he, he blames the media. He says because the legal system itself, look at the papers, read the transcripts, look at their verdict. It's 11.6 million against Madison Square Garden. He says, Stephen A., I worked at Terrytown, which is 40 minutes away. Steve Mills was the president of Madison Square Garden at the time. He didn't say that, but everybody knows Steve Mills was the president of Madison Square Garden. Steve Mills and James Dolan have adamantly denied they're guilty of such things, but that doesn't matter because the jury found MSG liable, and that's why you had to pay out $11.6 million. There's no get, and I keep saying, there's no getting around that. But where Isaiah comes in is that, read the particulars. He says, Stephon Marbury was guilty of having an affair with an intern who worked under a Nuka Brown Sanders. And as a result, because he was president, they said you're liable because your house was incorrect because this happened under your watch. And he said, how is that in God's name having me associated with sexual harassment? And then even the case that came down, it wasn't for sexual harassment. It was for a hostile working environment. And that working environment is not where I was working because I was 40 minutes away. So when he explains all of this stuff, but then you come back at him, Skip, and you try to tell him, look, man, it still said sexual harassment and your name was in it. He gets straight up volatile. He doesn't want to talk about it. He just repeatedly states he had nothing to do with this. He is completely innocent and he gets furious to okay. the point where people close to him literally have to walk away from him because that's how he feels. Well, I don't know what to say. Well, no, I really, really don't. To, 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 to piggyback off your point, and I'll just make this point quickly before you go, uh, Skip. James Dolan, I don't understand how he thought he could bring him into this situation and not have any pushback from WNBA owners because the optics don't look good. You can't hire someone and have them in charge of a woman's team when you have anything associated with them, especially in, ter in terms of sexual well, harassment. And also, I well, was going to answer that question. Well, no, no. I'm also, I was going to ask you this, and you tell me your your thoughts on this in terms of. I know I've met Isaiah through you. I think he's a great guy, and I know you say he gets upset when he discusses this topic. But by the way, we've had him on the show. And we've had him on the show. He's a yeah. good, yeah, he's a good guy. Twice, he's, twice, twice. He's a, he's a, yeah. I have nothing but great things to say about him just from my interaction. But he can't understand the pushback here. Can he not? He doesn't. He doesn't. He, he truly, truly does not. To answer your, because I need to get to your first point about Dolan, but to answer your second point, he does not understand it because his attitude is MSG was found liable. It was their working environment. He was not assessed any punitive damages that he had to pay out whatsoever because he's innocent in all of this. He has nothing to do with sexual harassment. 
That's his position. He believes it's a media creation rife with uh, rife with lies and exaggerations and embellishment. And he's very hostile about that. But to get to your first point about Dolan bringing Isaiah Thomas into the fray, here's what Dolan does have a very compelling argument that I would believe the Board of Governors for the WNBA would have to answer, Skip Kerry, in the event that they deny Isaiah co-ownership of the Liberty. If the case ultimately led to MSG being found guilty and liable, and they are the ones that have to pay out $11.6 million, if you don't want Isaiah Thomas, why do you want Jim Dolan and MSG? Because they're the ones that have to pay. If they're the ones that have been assigned culpability in all of this, okay. why is it that Isaiah Thomas is the one? That has to that that does be denied. If you want to de deny Isaiah ownership, how come you're not denying James Dolan ownership? Go ahead. Because it's MSG. He was found liable. He's the one that had to pay the 11.6 million dollars. Can you answer that, Step? I don't want to try to retry this case in our court of public opinion. The findings were the yeah. findings, and remember Isaiah's actions, alleged or whatever, that, that the findings were that he was at the center of this, that, that somehow he was involved in this. And again, I don't want to get into more specifics of the case, but I'm going to accept the findings of the court. And I'm going to go a step further, and I do like your James Dolan point, it's a fair one in the bigger picture. But let me just ask you this, let's keep it on Dolan for a second, because I often wonder this. Sure. Is James Dolan stupid or <laughs> is he just brazen? Because think about this. The, the mere fact, it, it's in, to, to Carrie's point, it is insultingly laughable to me right. that this man, James Dolan, would bring this man, Isaiah Thomas, after his involvement in this court case and the findings of the court in to be an owner of a women's basketball team. Yeah. It's, it's insulting to me because, to Carrie's point, it's a bad idea and it's a bad look for the WNBA. Maybe James Dolan's a bad look, too. I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. But is this man dumb, naive, or does he just delight in being everybody's favorite villain here? Because is he sitting back right yeah. now laughing at all of us? I got you again yeah, he because he, he loves to be the bad guy? Seriously. Because what is it, Stephen A? He had to know that this was going to be the negative reaction. He had to know. No other but company would hire somebody would. back. Nobody would. Nobody would. This is laughable to me. What is going on in the mind of this man? Does he like to be New York, New York City's favorite villain? Is that what's going on? Let me tell you something right now. The word stupid comes to mind when I think about him in the New York okay. Knicks. The word brazen comes to my mind when I think about James Dolan and everything else. All right. Because he is a billionaire. He simply does not care. This makes no sense to me. I've been on the record saying if you're going to bring Isaiah Thomas back, you bring him back to the Knicks. You don't bring him to the WNBA. Now, Isaiah Thomas is quick to tell anybody, you know something, you know, hostile working environment. Tell me where it says, get the paperwork. Okay. Tell me from the courts where it says sexual harassment and my name. That's his position and that's all he cares about. Fine. He doesn't care about anything <laughs> else. He cares about that. But in the end, in the end what it comes to is this, Skip. I agree with you. I look at, I look at Isaiah Thomas and I'm like, the WNBA? What? For what? Why? Why? Yeah. It yeah. makes no sense. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me. No. If he's going to be back, he hey, should be back correct. with the Knicks in some capacity, at least play a personnel. Look, it should be something like that, not this. Clearly. I agree. James Dolan loves Isaiah Thomas and always has. He's got a soft spot for him. They're, they're best buddies. Right. They're kind of running buddies, if you will. And if you want to bring him back as your personal assistant because you're grooming him to, to ultimately replace Phil Jackson, as the GM then or president. Then do that. Yeah, that's fine. Then do I, I, that. I mean, nobody would have raised an eyebrow, I don't think. Yeah. But this yeah. is just so insulting to everybody, and it's so vintage James Dolan. Brazen is an appropriate word, and obviously we all agree the optics of it just don't look good. Plain and simple. Anyone can see that. Robert Kraft's decision to stand down has made some think about the future of the Patriots and Tom Brady. Charles Pierce, who has written about Boston sports for decades, Suggest the following. I might wonder if this maneuver were nothing less than the opening days of the post-Brady era in Foxborough. 
He's 37 years old. And a cheaper option is waiting in the wings. This is a demonstrably unsentimental franchise, willing to cut ties even with valued and beloved players before those players go too far down the other side of the hill. This will become an infinitely more interesting question should Jimmy Garoppolo play well in Brady's absence this season. You may remember that crab toad from MQB, Peter King, that he liked Garoppolo, but he wasn't for sure about him until he <laughs> actually got out there to play. That's when you really know. We welcome to the desk our coach, Herm Edwards. Just a suggestion, just a thought here by Pierce. Um, your take to this. Well, this is why you draft a, a Jimmy Garoppolo. And I don't know if it's so much for right this year or next year, but you have to develop a guy. You remember, Tom Brady was drafted in the sixth round, and he sat on the bench. Uh, so I, I think when you look at their situation, is Tom Brady done? Well, all I know is the last game he played, he performed pretty dead gum good. He threw 50 passes. <laughs> And, and so, and won another Super Bowl. So I don't, I don't think they're going to try to run Tom Brady out of the building. Jimmy Garoppolo, depending on how this turns out with Tom Brady, if he misses any games, or he might not, according to how it, it's ruled in court. Right. But if he does miss games, Jimmy Garoppolo's going to play. Their offense will be a little bit different, I think, with Jimmy Garoppolo. Okay. So uh, going forward, I think Tom Brady at 38, if he stays healthy in the way they play, He's got at least another three years in him. We can say that about Peyton Manning. We can say that about Drew Brees. Sure. You know, they're getting to the point now in their career that you have to start developing a guy. Well, but the, the suggestion here is that Kraft decided to say, no, we're not going to appeal this because they're actually not 100% about Brady. No, it's bigger. It, it, it's, it goes bigger than Tom Brady. I, I think uh, Mr. Kraft understood that, uh, and he said it. He says there's 31 other owners that we're all in in this together and uh, for the betterment of the league uh, and that's what I think a lot of fans will realize sure. it's the betterment of the league the owners are always looking ahead that's what you have to do as an owner one thing about this this league there's, there's change there's changes in coaches there's changes in players you don't see too many owners changing <laughs> and the game continues to go on okay that's a part of the league that's part of the business side of it it's hard it's cruel it makes you look at some of the the best players to ever play and they say well it, it didn't end good for the guy Jelly doesn't, unless you retire on your own. Jelly doesn't good in, in for you. So I just think Tom Brady's in place right now. He's a starting quarterback. And going forward, Garoppolo may have an opportunity. All right, Stephen A. People need to do one of two things. Stop acting like brats <laughs> or be willing to admit that you are one. The other night when we were talking about the Knicks and the draft lottery, Coach Herm Edwards, Skip Bayless, I was a brat. I'm a native New Yorker. I'm disgusted with what I've seen from the pathetic atrocity that I'm witnessing in New York as it pertains to the Knicks. And I went on the air and I threw my objectivity out the window and I said, damn it, I'm upset. And I want you to know. OK, that is what Bostonians need to do and leave it at that. Robert Kraft made a decision in the best interest of the NFL. It superseded his interest because in the end when you do that it ultimately serves your interest robert Kraft's new england patriots franchise is worth over two billion dollars i am here to assure you he did not pay that much to own the patriots franchise 21 years ago it has elevated exponentially in value because the league has elevated exponentially in value because the networks validate that with the money they give the leagues to air their product. Not just on Sundays, not just Monday night, but also Thursday night as well, okay? On the NFL Network, on CBS, on Fox, on AB, uh, ESPN, the list goes on and on. It is what it is. This man looked at the big picture. Is Tom Brady worth the big picture? Of course he's not. No one player is. This is not an agenda to get Tom Brady out the door. This was Robert Kraft thinking about the NFL and recognizing as a businessman, it ain't good business to be fighting with your business partners. It may dilute the overall value, and we don't want that. Simple. Mm -hmm. And I very simply, strongly disagree with both of them. Oh, boy, we knew that. No, you didn't know this. Yeah. I'm, I'm now debating two people 
who presume guilt when it comes to Tom Brady and these footballs. So we're not I, saying he's guilty. Yes, you are. No, we're, we're not. not. You are. Why? It's okay. That's not it's the okay. issue. We're, we're not saying, saying that. that. But, but again, that's your perspective. I'm looking at the perspective of a of a great quarterback who could go down as the best quarterback of all time. You agree with that? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Okay. Whose reputation, we all agree, has been permanently tainted and tarnished by this. I don't think you can undo it. I don't think you can scrub this one off. Even if he goes to court and wins in court, which is a real long shot, right. I don't think you can scrub right. this reputation clean. Right. Because those out there who want to believe that he cheated will always believe that he cheated. Now, I cannot get, I, I can't let it compute in my head what Bob Kraft just did. It is the most stunning thing I've seen in a long, long time. The about face this man did on his quarterback when he had gone Al Davis on the National Football League all the way up to this point with a website. He attacked Goodell with a 20,000 word website. He attacked him in Peter King's column the other day. And then all of a sudden, because of a sort of a chance meeting at a birthday party, they sit down on the co couch, according to Adam Schefter, they hug it out, they talk it out. He's a league man. We get that. He might be the number one owner who is a league man. So he, he opted to protect the NFL's golden goose at the expense of the golden goose of a quarterback who won him four Super Bowl rings. I am here to suggest this is a cold-blooded organization that has done nothing but great business year after year. We've watched them do it to one player after another. When it's time to move on, they move on with no frills, no emotions, no heart, because it's business. It's the National Football League. Mm -hmm. If Tom Brady had been a 28-year-old quarterback and had just come off a Super Bowl MVP, I believe Bob Kraft would have seen it through on the appeals process just for the sake of his quarterback. But in this case, at 38, statistically, I can show you, because there have been a bunch of studies done about very good or great quarterbacks, 38's usually the jumping off point where they start to go south on you. And you said three more great years. Man, that would be 41. That would be unusual. Now, I'm not saying that you are It can't right. be done, yeah. yeah. But listen, you're going to be declining over those three years because remember after the Kansas City debacle on Monday Night Football this past year when they fell to two and two, I heard an outcry he about he is washed He's up. Done. Did we not hear that? You heard that from fans. You I didn't hear that from Bill I, Belichick. You didn't hear it from me so when I sat here. It's some some analysts. I heard it. From. Well, you didn't hear it from not me. From you. I said no. not so fast. Okay, I did too. I'm not, not so fast. I'm right there with you, but it's possible that it was easier for Bob Kraft to fold his tents and wave his white flag for the sake of the league because his quarterback is 38 and I know they really like this kid as Bob Kraft told Peter King who knows how well he'll do until he gets out there. I, who yeah. knows I don't know anything about him because I never watched him play yeah. down in college I don't know if anybody else did but I just yeah. didn't see him he reminds me a little bit of your guy in Dallas oh well he played at the same college Tony Romo okay well that makes There's sense a lot of little Tony Romo in him now Okay, and uh, so, so maybe he will turn into that. Maybe they've decided that's the way to go. But trust me on this. Tom Brady not happy with Bob Kraft's decision here because it left him a little bit in a lurch. He had his owner behind him 100%. All of a sudden, his owner is zero behind him. Well, I'll, I'll echo what, what Stephen A. said earlier. As much as you say about Tom Brady might be a little bit upset at the owner, there's a lot of people that have defended Tom Brady and they're hanging out there right now. And they probably don't feel real good about it either. Okay, I agree. Okay, so yeah. it works both ways now. Oh, okay. I mean, at the end, and I said it before, look, this could have been solved a long time ago. It never had to come to this. You did. Okay. But, okay. but it has. Okay, and so I'm just saying, but who, whose fault is that? Yeah, I'm at, who, 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 you, who right, answer that question? Whose fault is that? You answer that question. Who, who, I'm just asking if, if, you if, I'm, if I'm innocent, if I'm innocent, and nothing has happened to me. Yeah. Okay. Well, not, I, well, not just that, coach. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You want to go? Not just that, coach. Go ahead. Not just that. As it pertains to both you and Skip, as men specifically, if you guys, if I sat up there and I was found guilty of something or I was being accused of something. Uh -uh. You would, knowing me the way that you do, you would come to my defense, yes. but only so much. If I'm quiet, at some yeah. point in time, especially you, Skip, you'd be like, man, you got to say something. <laughs> say no, something. He just can't sit there and say nothing. The first thing I would do is I would pick up my cell phone. And by the way, you're happy to have my cell phone if you want it. But I would pick up my cell phone and call you and I'd say, what is up? Yeah. Tell me the truth. 
And if you told me I'm 100% innocent, I would have your back till death do us part. Trust me, I would have your back. That's not what I said. That's not what okay. I said. But that's not what I said. I'm not que- I'm not questioning that. I know that about you, my brother from another mother. That is oh, true. I get that part. I'm saying to you that you would get sick and tired. You, there's no way that you would sit back and be quiet while I allowed everybody else to do all the talking for weeks upon weeks at a time. And I didn't say anything, which is what, correct me if I'm wrong, Coach, yes. what you're alluding to yeah, when right. we talk yeah. about what Tom Brady could have done yeah. for himself. Skip, I'm alarmed. I'm alarmed that he has allowed so many people to speak when he hasn't, when it's so simple for him to just sit there and debunk all of this. Okay, it really but, is. But now we're getting and I'm not saying he did anything. Okay, l- l- don't sit and I'm not I'm not sitting here saying did it. All I know is it could have been solved from the beginning. With the equipment guy and Tom Brady in the room, you get him there, whoever that is. How? Why? Why why would you ask that question if Tom Brady's completely innocent? Because wait a minute, because something happened with the balls. If I'm going to have after the AFC championship. All I know is this. Is that what you mean, though? Yes. Okay. All all I know is this. Say what you said last week. Look, you're the coach. You get him in the room. You get the equipment guy. If something has been said to your organization, hey, you know what? Yeah. Uh, This team complained about balls. Sure. I'm the head coach. Boop. Red light goes on. Whoa. Let me get the equipment guy in here. Let me get the quarterback in here. Hey, you know anything about this? And then have the conversation. Ask Tom Brady, hey, did you ask this guy to make the balls a little softer when it was cold? So and, Tom and, says no. And no. And Tom says no. He says no. He says no. Then he says, well, then why did you do it? Then you ask the equipment guy, why did you do it? Why did you let air out of these balls? Well, we don't have proof that they did let the air out of the balls. The Wells report is not completely 100% clear they did. But there was a whole group of balls by one gauge that, that in these balls were underinflated. That's fine. But right okay. now, right now, the signal was... The, 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 the You're buying the Wells No, no, no. I'm not, before the Wells report, when Indianapolis... They just accused. When it, they accused. Well, then that's why you bring the coach. The coach brings the, okay. both parties in there. Well, trust me, they gets did. gets it done from the... They did. Before... Okay. But don't before you think what? they did it? Before what, coach? Before all this gets to where it's at right now. It could have been alleviated, real simple. Quarterback... Head coach, equipment guy, have a conversation. One last point, Skip. One last quick point. Not just Robert Kraft, but prior to Robert Kraft, Bill Belichick. You have two prominent individuals within the Patriots Mm -hmm. organization who have been accused of throwing Tom Brady under the bus. Immediately following the AFC Championship game, Bill Belichick was asked about it. He says, you got to talk to my quarterback. I don't Mm -hmm. know anything about that. And then later on, now Robert Kraft, because of his decision, is being accused of the same thing. And Bill Belichick, your coach who you love dearly, Robert Kraft, your owner who you've known 16 years, you love dearly, they are accused of throwing you under the bus. And you still have nothing to say? Well, wait a second. It's going to a court of law very potentially now. And as I told you earlier, when you hire Jeffrey Kessler, now he's going to tell you, Muzzle, you can't say anything publicly from this point forward because it's going to court. So I got you for the okay. early phase. But but again, if to, to Coach Herm's idea, if you go, I, trust me, they had a whole week before the Super Bowl to do exactly what you said. They had a whole week before the Super Bowl. Okay, what if they asked Tom Brady? They had he the said, day of, the day next day. <laughs> okay, and, he, and Tom Brady says, I never asked them to do anything but to inflate to the lower end of regulation. And the equipment people say, that's all we ever did was lower end of regulation. And Belichick says to Kraft, I don't know anything about this at all. Okay, now what are you going to do? Well, then you found out the truth, and then, then, then there's the truth. Okay, so and you, and you, and you tell the commissioner, this is what happened. Okay. Help them with it. The, help them. They, did they? Well, remember, Bob Kraft shows up at the Super Bowl on, what was it, the first day they landed. Yeah. He marches straight to the podium, and he says, you will owe he us an apology. apology. Yeah, well, then well, I get all that. Okay. But obviously, they didn't have enough information. Well, I'm does the NFL have know. enough in, information? Hey, you know what? Know. It's a mess. Right now, Gino's the starter, and uh, there's... Uh, to me, Coach Bowles has said it. I say it. Uh, I think everybody said it. That's the way it. That's the way it sits, and that's the way we expect it to be. Um, I, you know, unless something happens that you get an injury or something like that that you don't foresee, that's how we anticipate it going.
So that was uh, Jets offensive coordinator Chan Gailey naming Geno Smith the team's starter. Despite the 34 interceptions he had in his first two seasons, uh, Coach Todd Bowles has only gone as far as saying that is the plan, to give him first team reps during starting uh, training camp. So I have a question for our coach, because you said before he went to break, that's in pencil. It's in pencil. Do you really believe that they're going to make him the starter? Yes. I mean, he, he has a start. It's his job to lose. Uh, I know Chan Gailey. Uh, he worked for me in Kansas City. He's been a head coach in this league twice with your Dallas Cowboys, with the Buffalo Bills. He's a really good offensive-minded guy. Uh, he'll put him in position to have some success. They went out and got Brandon Marshall, obviously. That's going to help them as well with the receiving core they have now. So I just think Geno Smith, he has to understand something. You can't turn the ball over 41 times. He's turned the ball over the last two years 41 times. Fitzpatrick, by the way, can't practice. This yeah. was this was not that hard of a decision. Okay. You know, and I think what because they do. Because broken leg, he's recovering. That, and they take the air out of the ball from the media. I hate that I shouldn't say that. They take the, they, they take the air away from the you know media what you're talking about. in the yeah. fact that when you go to practice and you say, you know what, there's competition at the quarterback position. Sure. Every practice, kind of when Tim Tebow was there, we actually had a a studio there, and they were ch everyone's charting throws. It was 7.07, he started, he did this. Then they get into the locker room. They ask the players after the first week, hey, who do you think the starting quarterback should be? It becomes one of those deals. Geno Smith is the guy. They drafted him. He gets an opportunity. He finished the season kind of going this way. Yep. Okay, sure. so you say, hey, let's give this guy a chance. Sure. Geno, you want to be the starter? It's your ball. You go play with it. Now, we'll see what happens. Okay, knowing Chan the way you know him, yes. is it possible he's taking Geno on as sort of a pet project? Mm -hmm. Like, I can I can No do doubt. This. No I, doubt. I there is no doubt. The best he can be? There's no doubt. And he will do everything he can to make this young man successful. Yeah, right. He'll, he'll put him in a lot of what I call a shotgun, uh, you know, the, the pistol, because he's, 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 he seems to feel very comfortable in that. He'll get him on the edge some, throwing the ball. He'll get the ball out of his hand very fast. So uh, he's going to have a chance to have some success. Now, Stephen A. Coach says uh, Geno Smith's the starter in pencil, and they will work with him. Yes. Your take. Well, I don't care whether I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's in crayon. It doesn't matter to me. And the fact of the matter is, when week one comes, even if Geno Smith is the starter, it's not considered the long-term solution for the New York Jets. They've made this, they've turned this defense into an elite defense with the acquisitions of Darrell Revis and Antonio Cromartie, the joint milliner retaining David Harris, not letting him escape to Buffalo, still having uh, Richardson and Muhammad Wilkinson and Copels and those boys and drafting Williams. Uh, this defense is expected to be big time. And then offensively, you've got a number one receiver in Brandon Marshall who's looking forward to coming to New York. Skip, I saw him on the streets of Chicago last week when I was there. He can't wait to get to New York and do his thing. So you you got him, you got Decker, uh, you've got some decent runners, Bilal Powell, you got uh, Ridley and those boys in New York. Bottom line is this, the only question mark is the quarterback position. And the only reason is a question is not because of Geno, it's because of Bryce Petty. How long is it going to take to get this brother developed and ready to go? Because we all know that he has tremendous potential, and I think you can expect some big things. And there's other people that use the Baylor system itself and says that's not conducive to succeeding in the NFL. We'll see about that because RG3, last time I checked, tore the house down at least his rookie year. But in the end, I just look at Geno Smith. He had a QBR of 35. He had just 13 touchdowns and 13 interceptions. Okay, as Coach said, you turned the ball over 41 times. When you look at their passing attack, it was ranked dead last in yards last year, and their offense was ranked 28th overall, even though they had the third leading rushing attack in the NFL, which means that your passing game is just putrid, pathetic. All those things considered, you've got to look at Geno Smith. And he hasn't endeared himself into being perceived as a leader for a franchise. Not when you're at the movies in San Diego instead of in a film room, for crying out loud. So all of those things, I don't believe bode well for him. But I think this is a matter of when Bryce Petty will be ready. And that will determine what happens between Geno Smith and Ryan Fitzpatrick. But I think ultimately Bryce Petty will be the new starting quarterback for the New York Jets. It's just a matter of when, not if. So back to Coach here. So we've got one written in in pencil. We've got one written in in crayon. crayon. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to write it in in invisible ink. Okay. Because I, I'm sorry, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I believe, for Gino. For Gino. Okay. I believe that Ryan Fitzpatrick is the short term and that Bryce Petty is now the long term for the New York Jets. 
nothing against Gino. I, I just don't think he's the right fit at the right time, especially for the team they have now assembled. This team could be really, really good. Yes. This team could be the surprise team of the National Football League. Again, we have a rookie head coach, but I have nothing but high expectations for young Todd Bowles because I think he's going to be a stud. And when you add a Zach Stacy and a Stephen Ridley to the Ivory and Bill Al Powell who are already there, I think you can run the ball. I think that's stable of backs. Well, they ran the ball last year. They yes. had no problem running the football. Yes. This defense. Am I wrong? It, it could be the best defense in football this year. No, it they, could be. Yeah, they, they went yeah. out and bought the man secondary. that Stephen A. ran into on the streets of Chicago. Brandon Marshall is a possession receiver. Neither of us love Eric Decker, but you still got him as your number two. Well, we got and Smith, too. Devin I like him as a number two. I didn't like him as a number one. I got it. I like him as a number two. I got it. Well, this is made to order. If you want to make a splash, Todd Bowles, for Ryan Fitzpatrick. He's not great, but listen, he's not bad either. He started 89 games in the National Football League. That's a lot of football that he's played, and I think he can do this oh, pretty yeah. well. Can this he? is why, and, and, and right. he played for Chan yeah. in, in Buffalo. Makes sense. So, I mean, this oh, yeah, is why he's there. So, I mean, yeah, this is yeah, why, there. okay, there's a reason that he's there. And, okay. and this is why I say it's Geno's deal. But if he starts turning it over and this offense doesn't go, and he's right, he's got a defense that can help him, that will give him a short field because they'll take the ball away. But he has to orchestrate the offense. That's all he has to do. Baseball on ESPN Radio. This season, the Mets have been a tale of two teams. One of the league's best at home and one of the worst on the road. Towards the corner. Ah! This weekend, they'll be at home at City Field facing the Marlins. Will their home field domination continue or will Giancarlo Stanton lead Miami to a road win? The Mets and Marlins. The pregame's at 3.30 Eastern, followed by the first pitch at 4.30. Saturday on ESPN Radio and the new ESPN app. A New Jersey judge has dismissed domestic violence charges against Ray Rice after he completed his pre-trial intervention program. Rice was required to attend the program for a minimum of one year, with the charge said to be dismissed upon his successful completion of the program. Uh, with his NFL suspension overturned, Rice is available to any team willing to give him a second chance. Our John Clayton wrote that uh, there are several teams that could be interested in putting him on the roster, and these are the ones that uh, make sense. Dallas Cowboys, Cleveland Browns, Oakland Raiders, New England Patriots, and the Indianapolis Colts. Herm, still hanging out with us. So, where do you see Ray Rice? I think the perfect fit would be the Dallas Cowboys, to be quite honest, for Ray Rice. I think he brings something that they need. He needs a guy that uh, obviously can come out of the backfield and catch football. Uh, when you think about uh, what has happened, they went out and got Derrick McFadden. Uh, he's, all, he's been injury prone, carried the ball 82 times uh, last year. Think about Dallas Cowboys. They ran the ball last year 507 times. Wait, I have a question for yes. you, though. Do you see him as a start? No. This he's going to be a backup, right? It, it, yeah. This, he's going to have a role. I mean, this is why I got to the number. The Dallas Cowboys ran the ball 507 times. Okay. Okay, McFadden ran it 300 and uh, Murray, excuse me, ran it 392 times. So they want to run the football. McFadden can't do that. He can't carry it 300 times, almost 400 times. No back's going to be able to do that. They need, a, they need a dual backfield. Okay. He would help them, especially on third down, situation football. He can still catch the football. Um, he has something to prove. Uh, I've, talking to, I've talked to Ray. Really? Uh, yes. And um, it's not even about the money for him. It's really about he doesn't want to end his career the way it ended. Okay. He would like to have a second chance. And hopefully someone will give him that. And I, when I spoke to him earlier, I told him before the draft, look, this is how it's going to work out for you probably. You're going to draft guys. No one's going to get involved in you. You're going to have OTAs. No one's going to talk to you. After the OTAs, and people start looking at their football team sure. and figuring out who's who, the holes. They, all of a sudden you're going to be a guy that's name's going to pop up. So you better be ready because you, you're going to get another chance. Where that is, I don't know. You're a coach of the Dallas Cowboys, figuratively speaking. You give him another chance? I would. I'd look at him. I mean, look at the guys that are bringing in, working out. I mean, this is a guy you need to bring in. I know his last year there, uh, you know, wasn't very good, but their offensive line wasn't very good. And he was hurt. When I, the conversation I had with him was the coach. I was hurt. He said, you know, I, I wasn't well. The offensive line was in flux. So all these things play into it. He's still a young player. He's only 28 years old. It's not like he's an old back. So he's had a year off. Um, Hopefully someone gives him a shot, and I think Dallas would be a good place for him because their offensive line and what they do, their system would fit what he can do. Stephen A., where do you see a Ray Rice with any of these five teams? 
I don't see. I don't know if any of the five teams will pick him up. Obviously, Dallas is a name that comes to mind. The Cleveland Browns, who's in the AFC North, is the names that come to mind. But to be quite honest with you, I think the best situation for him would be the Baltimore Ravens, right where he's been. Not in Dallas, particularly when you've got Greg Hardy there now. You don't want both of them on the same team in light of the negative attention they are responsible for bringing to the NFL in the last year. There's no way around that. And, Coach, forgive me, let's just talk about the bigger issue here. And I appreciate you letting us know that you've spoken to him. We have to, at some point in time, address the big elephant in the room. And the big elephant in the room is whether or not somebody deserves a second chance. Ray Rice did what he did. It was reprehensible. Yes. It was it was egregious and it was criminal. He had to go through the legal system and whatever conclusion the legal system put him through or he put himself through. He's endured that the NFL. He was going from the NFL the entire season last year. Now we have to ask ourselves as a society, if somebody is not in jail, then they're out here in our society. And what are we going to do about that? He went through the legal system. He paid his penance. He suffered the consequences. Deservedly so, I yes, might add. Yes. Now you have to ask yourself, am I supposed to look at a 28-year-old who, by the way, is now married with a child, to the woman he assaulted, okay, am I supposed to look at him and say he never deserves a second chance? Or he does. That's the decision that we have to make. And my attitude is if you've gone through the legal system and you paid whatever penance they say that you were supposed to pay, now it's time for a second chance. That's my position. Others who may not feel that way, what I would ask them is, well, then what are you proposing that we do with him? Because if he's unemployed, I got news for folks in our society. Folks who are unemployed and are not gainfully employed, their problems end up being our problems. Mm. Well Just said, and, and uh, when, when we know when, when young people get incarcerated and they've done their time, um, obviously they get out in the working world, they need the job. Of course they need <laughs> Okay, the so I mean, this man has, has, has done what he's done. His and, wife's forgiven him. He's hey, moved on. And I, we, we've all gone through chance. it. He, yeah. he became the face of domestic violence. He did. Mm -hmm. He became the face of it, okay? We, we get that. And, I, and it, was, it was ugly. It, it wasn't good. Right. But now he's done everything he has to do. He's been forthright with it. Yeah. Okay. And correct and, me if I'm wrong. He's used this as a teachable moment. He is speaking out. He's doing. He's what done he's everything he can do. do. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Skip, your take. I don't love your idea of Dallas Cowboys. Why? Stephen A. did make a good point about this. Once you have a Greg Hardy, it's difficult to bring into the fold a Ray Rice, no matter whether he's paid his dues, paid his penance. Sure. No, no it's matter too much attention. It's just so yeah. much that you have other controversial players, one that you have also helped, Randy Gregory, for different issues. And you and, have and Lyle Collins for a different, whole different And issue. Des Bryant. And Des Bryant, for that matter. Yep. You do. Okay. And it's worked out well for all of them thus far. Jerry's good at this, but I don't know how many you can add on top of it, and I just don't know if you could add Ray Rice on top of Greg Hardy. It might not be the look that I think maybe even the commissioner would give Jerry a call and say, I, I just don't know if this is a great look for us for you to have both those players on one team. That's just me. Now, let's keep it on the football field. Yes. I'm not convinced it was just because he was hurt two years ago. Okay. His production fell all the way down to 3.1 yards per carry. Now, if he's coming off the 2011 year, and we're having to go back four years, Five. when he led the National Football League in total yards from scrimmage, both running and catching it, he had 1364 running it and 704 catching it. That's big time, man. Well, you know this league as well as I do. That somebody would be saying, hey, I don't care what, you know, I'll, I'll take the hits image-wise if there are right. those to be taken. Talent he can off. play. Yeah. He can still play. I'm not sure he can still play. Now, should he get a chance to prove on the field that he can play? That's all he wants is a chance. Okay. All it's, right. not, it's not a guaranteed contract. If he's no good, you cut him. Right. Cut him in the preseason. Say, you know what, you can't do it anymore. Okay, so he would be in a cast of thousands now that they have at running backs if, at Dallas if they brought him in because now they're trying out Ben Tate and Felix Jones' yes. return, you know. That's okay. He's Skip. 28 years of age. Yeah, go ahead. Skip Bayless, Coach Herm Edwards, 
How much does psychology play into into the success or failure of a football player? Uh, in my opinion, a lot. Yes. And anybody. What about you, Skip? Hugely. If that's the case, then why have him go anywhere other than Baltimore? You have people in Baltimore who were supportive of him before everything came down and after. You have a system and a coach he's familiar with. Mm -hmm. And he would be in a position where he knows the system. He All he has to do to perform, even though Justin Forsett is there, and I don't think he's taking Justin Forsett's job, the bottom line is, is that it's an ideal situation for him if he does one other thing, Coach. He needs to apologize to Bashadi, well, the owner, yeah. because he tried to help you. Yeah, you threw him out there. Wouldn't that bridge burn, not burn to the yeah. ground, set yeah. on fire? No, 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 not, not if he apologizes. Not if he apologizes with, the, with what he endured. Mistakes happen, and Ray Rice made a bunch of them. He owes that owner an apology. You if he apologized to, to that man, I think the owner would be receptive. You want to make a point before I let Coach get out of here? No. Okay. I'm good. Coach, We're good. quickly, though, before yes. you go, you said you've spoken to him. You, you've been around him. Mentally, how's he doing? He's okay. He, he just wants another opportunity. He doesn't want to end his career the way it ended. He'd like to have another chance. And as I said, hey, he doesn't want a guarantee. Yeah. He just wants to get into a camp. I think he wants know. to prove himself. Yeah. Okay. That's what he wants. Game three of the Western Conference Finals kicks off Saturday in Houston. The Warriors took the first two games and teams up 2-0 in the best of seven series have won 94% of series in NBA postseason history. However, the Rockets are tied with the Warriors for the best record at home this postseason. Houston scoring 112 points per game at home. That's 12 more than the Warriors at Oracle. So, Bayless, Skip, who wins game three? Champion, Carey. <laughs> Smith, Stephen A. Since I picked the Warriors to sweep this series, I'm a little shaky with it right now. I, I guess I better pick the Warriors to win game three. I think it'll be another fight to the finish. I, I want to say publicly, Stephen A., that even though I've doubted the Rockets, they have extremely impressed me in the first two games. Their fight to the finish has been extremely impressive to me. But in the end... I believe that Steph Curry is a little bit better than James Harden, and I think his late game will is a little bit stronger than James Harden's. Steph keeps making the plays to win the game at the end, game one, game two, and I believe he'll do it again in game three. And Stephen A., the, the odds makers are still favoring Golden State in game three at Houston by a point and a half. So, so they're just saying that... Golden State's just a little better than the Rockets. I don't doubt that the Rockets in this pivotal Game 3 will go down swinging, but I'm going to stick with Golden State to win another tight, great, late game. No, I'm going to go with the Rockets. I predict that they lose this series in six games. This is their only shot to pull that off. They don't win Game 3. This series is over in four or five. They absolutely positively have to protect their home court. Um, I, I'm willing to modify my position and tell you it's possible they're going to lose in five. But I just think they're too skilled. They've got too much heart and pride to get swept. And, and they are they are on the, on the brink of the brink as far as I'm concerned. They can't lose this game. No. Otherwise, they're going to get they, – they may get swept. So I think they will be desperate Saturday night. They will feed off of that home crowd. They will show up. They will perform. They will get it done. I think they beat the Warriors in game three and, and close this series to 2-1. I got one stat to throw at you, and I'm not a big stat guy, yep. but this one grabbed me and shook me up today when I let it sink in. Do you realize that Steph yep. Curry now through these playoffs is only one three-pointer behind the all-time playoff record by Reggie Miller? Mm -hmm. Reggie Miller. Of 58 yep. set in 2000, mm -hmm. and he set that record in 22 playoff games that year. Steph so far has played 12. So already Steph Curry has 57 threes in just 12 playoff games. So I think he's going to break the record. I, I, think I just so. think he's going to break the record. Well, I, well, 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 I know he's going to break the record, and, and he deserves credit for making those shots. But let's understand that even though Reggie Miller had a, different, a green light, he had a different team. You had the Rick Smiths of the world, the Antonio Davises, and the Dale, Dale Davises Davis, of yep. the world to consider. 
And so what happens is you have big boys that you needed to feed and throw the ball down low. Plus, again, the game was far different then than it is now. It was far more physical. They could get up in you. Uh, the level of duress that they were allowed to call you without every ticky-tack foul being called was definitely relevant. So, so when you take that into consideration, again, you're not taking anything away from the greatness of a, of a Steph Curry because he is lethal. Uh, but at the same time, I just don't look at it the way that you do because, again, with Golden State, he has the ultimate green light and everybody's looking to give him and Klay Thompson the ball and they, the rest of them find their shots. While Reggie Miller, yeah, he was your perimeter threat, but they played a slower brand of basketball and you had big boys that you needed to feed and make happy as well. So it was a different system. Silly me when I'm rooting for the Warriors. Yeah. I like it when it's in Steph's hands. I don't really love it when it's in the other guy's hands. The other guy. It's just me. I That's agree with you. Yeah. All right. I agree. Breaking news, breaking news on the Twitterverse. This just tweeted five minutes ago from Shaq. At Real Skip Bayless, you are a stat guy. You're the best. You're quotatious. And most of all... You're sexy. Oh. Love you too, Stephen A. Smith. Oh, oh, that's an afterthought. Yeah, he, he threw, loves Stephen he A. Smith. He threw that in there. Yeah. Shaq, I want to say you are the best basketball analyst on all of television. <laughs> you are certainly the best on TNT, and I appreciate it. And my woman, Ernestine, appreciates that sexy comment also. Like, Thank you very much. I'm uncomfortable. Go on, Stephen no, A. <laughs> well, for, well, 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 first of all, we know by the fact that Shaq calls uh, Skip sexy. We know that Shaq. Jack clearly just woke up in the morning, oh, just didn't that. rub his eyes nearly <laughs> enough, can't see. All right, so we understand that that's number one. Number two, number two, and more importantly, him sitting up in there and skip, listening to Skip call him the best basketball analyst. He, I, he's getting better yeah. because he's finally learning to listen. He's talking. Well, he's getting. He's talking and he's not mumbling. He takes so over he the show. He what makes he the said. best points. Nine he yells you thought, at, you thought he, he yells at won me. The contest, right? He yes. yells at me and gets on the yes. air and mumbles the with everybody else. else. He's starting lip to talk to me. So I'm Shaq, pleased. We we enjoyed I'm you lip syncing. We oh, thought you should have. He was amazing. Was he not? Bird, right. The bird. His hands dropped. He was fine. All right. Anyway, he I. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and don't forget to check out mine, Be Honest, with Carrie Champion. And you can catch First Take Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific, on ESPN2. Miguel Cabrera leads the Detroit Tigers into Anaheim to face Mike Trout and the Los Angeles Angels. The pregame's at 7 Eastern, followed by first pitch at 8, Sunday on ESPN2 and on ESPN Radio.